The American Yap. Chapter 21. World War I and its Aftermath. Section 1. Introduction. World War I, also known as the Great War, toppled empires, created new nations, and sparked tensions that would explode across future years. On the battlefield, gruesome modern weaponry wrecked an entire generation of young men. The United States entered the conflict in 1917 and was never again the same. The war heralded to the world the United States' potential as a global military power, and domestically, it advanced but then beat back American progressivism by unleashing vicious waves of repression. The war simultaneously stoked national pride and fueled disenchantments that burst progressive era hopes for the modern world. And it laid the groundwork for a global depression, a second world war, and an entire history of national, religious, and cultural conflict around the globe. Section 2. Prelude to War as the German Empire rose in power and influence at the end of the 19th century, skilled diplomats maneuvered this disruption of traditional powers and influences into several decades of European peace. In Germany, however, a new ambitious monarch would overshadow years of tactful diplomacy. Wilhelm II rose to the German throne in 1888. He admired the British Empire of his grandmother, Queen Victoria, and envied the Royal Navy of Great Britain so much that he attempted to build a rival German Navy and plant colonies around the globe. The British viewed the prospect of a German Navy as a strategic threat, but, jealous of what he perceived as a lack of prestige in the world, Wilhelm II pressed Germany's case for access to colonies and symbols of status suitable for a world power. Wilhelm's maneuvers and Germany's rise spawned a new system of alliances as rival nations warily watched Germany's expansion. In 1892, German posturing world worried the leaders of Russia and France and prompted a defensive alliance to counter the existing triple threat between Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. Britain's Queen Victoria remained unassociated with the alliances until a series of diplomatic crises and an emerging German naval threat led the British agreements with Tsar Nicholas II and French President Émile Loubet in the early 20th century. The alliance between Great Britain, France, and Russia became known as the Triple Entente. The other great threat to European peace was the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. While the leaders of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire showed little interest in colonies elsewhere, Turkish lands on its southern border appealed to their strategic goals. However, Austria-Hungarian expans expansion in Europe worried Tsar Nicholas II, who saw Russia as both the historic guarantor of the Slavic nations in the Balkans and the competitor for territories governed by the Ottoman Empire. By 1914, the Austria-Hungarian Empire had control of Bosnia and Herzegovina and viewed Slavic Serbia, a nation protected by Russia, as its next challenge. On June 28, 1914, after Serbian Gavrilo Princip assassinated the Austrian-Hungarian heirs to the throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Grand Duchess Sophie, vengeful nationalist leaders believed the time had come to eliminate the rebellious ethnic Serbian threat. On the other side of the Atlantic, the United States played an insignificant role in global diplomacy. It rarely forayed into internal European politics. The federal government did not participate in international diplomatic alliances, but nevertheless championed and assisted with the expansion of the transatlantic economy. American businesses and consumers benefited from the trade generated as the result of the extended period of European peace. Stated American attitudes toward international affairs followed the advice given by President George Washington in his 1796 farewell address, 120 years before America's entry into World War I. He had recommended that his fellow countrymen avoid, quote, foreign alliances, attachments, and intrigues, end quote, and, quote, those overgrown military establishments which, under any form of government, are inauspicious to liberty and which are to be regarded as particularly hostile to Republican liberty, end quote. A foreign policy of neutrality reflected in America's inward-looking focus on the construction and management of its new powerful industrial economy, built in large part with foreign capital. The federal government possessed limited diplomatic tools with which to engage in international struggles for world power. America's small and increasingly antiquated military precluded forceful coercion and left American diplomats to persuade by reason, appeals to justice, or economic coercion. 
But in the 1880s, as Americans embarked upon empire, Congress authorized the construction of a modern navy. The army, nevertheless, remained small and underfunded compared to the armies of many industrializing nations. After the turn of the century, the army and navy faced a great deal of organizational uncertainty. New technologies, airplanes, motor vehicles, submarines, modern artillery, stressed the capability of army and navy personnel to effectively procure and use them. The nation's army could police Native Americans in the West and garrison recent overseas acquisitions, but it could not sustain a full-blown conflict of any size. The Davis Act of 1908 and the National Defense Act of 1916 inaugurated the rise of the modern versions of the National Guard and military reserves. A system of state-administered units available for local emergencies that received conditional federal funding for training could be activated for use in international wars. The National Guard program encompassed individual units separated by state borders. The program supplied summer training for college students as a reserve officer corps. Federal and state governments now had a long-term strategic reserve of trained soldiers and sailors. Border troubles in Mexico served as an important field test for modern American military forces. Revolution and chaos threatened American business interests in Mexico. Mexican former, uh, Mexican reformer rather, Francisco Madero challenged Porfiero Diaz's corrupt and unpopular conservative regime. He was jailed, sent or fled to San Antonio, and penned the plan of San Luis Potosi, paving the way for the Mexican Revolution and the rise of armed revolutionaries across the country. In April 1914, President Woodrow Wilson ordered Marines to accompany a naval escort to Veracruz on the lower eastern coast of Mexico. After a brief battle, the Marines supervised the city government and prevented shipments of German arms to Mexican leader Victor Huerta until they departed in November 1914. The raid emphasized the continued reliance on naval forces and the difficulty in modernizing the military during a period of European imperial influence in the Caribbean and elsewhere. The threat of war in Europe enabled the passage of the Naval Act in 1916. President Wilson declared that the national goal was to build the Navy as, quote, incomparably the greatest in the world, end quote. And yet Mexico still beckoned. The Wilson administration had withdrawn its support of Diaz, but watched warily as the revolution devolved into assassinations and deceit. In 1916, Pancho Villa, a popular revolutionary in northern Mexico, raided Columbus, New Mexico, after being provoked by American support for his rivals. His raiders killed 17 Americans and burned down the town center before American soldiers forced their retreat. In response, President Wilson commissioned Army General John Blackjack Pershing to capture Villa and disperse his rebels. Motorized vehicles, reconnaissance aircraft, and the wireless telegraph aided in the pursuit of Villa. Motorized vehicles, in particular, allowed General Pershing to obtain supplies without relying on railroads controlled by the Mexican government. The aircraft assigned to the campaign crashed or were grounded by mechanical malfunctions, but they provided invaluable lessons in their worth and use in war. Wilson used the powers of the new National Defense Act to mobilize over 100,000 National Guard units across the country as a show of force in northern Mexico. The conflict between the United States and Mexico might have escalated into a full-scale war if the international crisis in Europe had not overwhelmed the public's attention. After the outbreak of war in Europe in 1914, President Wilson declared American neutrality. He insisted from the start that the United States be neutral in fact as well as in name, a policy the majority of American people enthusiastically endorsed. It was unclear, however, what neutrality meant in a world of close economic connections. Ties to the British and French proved strong, and those nations obtained far more loans and supplies than the Germans. In October 1914, President Wilson approved commercial credit loans to the combatants, which made it increasingly difficult for the nation to claim impartiality as war spread throughout Europe. Trade and financial relations with the Allied nations ultimately drew the United States further into the conflict. In spite of mutually declared blockades between Germany, Great Britain, and France, munitions and other war suppliers in the United States witnessed a brisk and booming increase in business. The British naval blockades that often stopped or seized ships proved annoying and costly, but the unrestricted and surprised torpedo attacks from German submarines were deadly. In May 1915, Germans sank the RMS Lusitania. Over a hundred American lives were lost. The attack, coupled with other German attacks on American and British shipping, raised the ire of the public and stoked the desire for war. 
American diplomatic tradition avoided former alli formal alliances, and the army seemed inadequate for sustained overseas fighting. However, the United States outdistanced the nations of Europe in one important me measure of world power. By 1914, the nation held the top position in the global industrial economy. The United States was producing slightly more than one-third of the world's manufactured goods, roughly equal to the outputs of France, Great Britain, and Germany combined. Section 3. War Spreads Through Europe After the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand and Grand Duchess Sophie, Austria secured the promise of aid from its German ally and issued a list of ten ultimatums to Serbia. On July 28, 1914, Austria declared war on Serbia for failure to meet all of the demands. Russia, determined to protect Serbia, began to mobilize its armed forces. On August 1, 1914, Germany declared war on Russia to protect Austria after warnings directed at Tsar Nicholas II failed to stop Russian preparations for war. In spite of the Central European focus uh, of the initial crises, the first blow was struck against neutral Belgium in northwestern Europe. Germany planned to take advantage of sluggish Russian mobilization by focusing the German army in France. German military leaders recycled tactics developed earlier and activated the Schlieffen Plan, which moved German armies rapidly by rail to march through Belgium and into France. However, this violation of Belgian neutrality also ensured that Great Britain entered the war against Germany. On August 4, 1914, Great Britain declared war on Germany for failing to respect Belgium as a neutral nation. In 1915, the European War had developed into a bloody series of trench stalemates that continued through the following year. Offensives, largely carried out by British and French armies, achieved nothing but huge numbers of casualties. Peripheral campaigns against the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, at Gallipoli, throughout the Middle East, and in various parts of Africa either were unsuccessful or had little bearing on the European contest for victory. The third year of the war, however, witnessed a coup for German military prospects. The regime, the regime rather, of Tsar Nicholas II collapsed in Russia in March 1917. At about the same time, the Germans again pursued unrestricted submarine warfare to deprive the Allies of replenishment supplies from the United States. The Germans, realizing that submarine warfare could spark an American intervention, hoped the European war would be over before American soldiers could arrive in sufficient numbers to alter the balance of power. A German diplomat, Arthur Zimmerman, planned to complicate the potential American intervention. He offered support to the Mexican government via a desperate bid to regain Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Mexican national leaders declined the offer, but the revelation of the Zimmerman telegram helped usher the United States into the war. Section 4. America Enters the War by the fall of 1916 and the spring of 1917, President Wilson believed an imminent German victory would drastically and dangerously alter the balance of power in Europe. Submarine warfare and the Zimmerman telegram, meanwhile, inflamed public opinion. Congress declared war on Germany in April 4, 1917. The nation entered the war 3,000 miles away with a small and unprepared military. The United States was unprepared in nearly every aspect for modern war. Considerable time elapsed before an effective army and navy could be assembled, trained, equipped, and deployed to the Western Front in Europe. The process of building the army and navy for the war proved to be different from previous conflicts. Unlike the largest European military powers of Germany, France, and Austria-Hungary, no tradition existed in the United States to maintain large standing forces or trained military reserves during peacetime. Moreover, there was no American counterpart to the European practice of rapidly equipping, training, and mobilizing reservists and conscripts. The U.S. historically relied solely on traditional volunteerism to fill the ranks of the armed forces. Notions of patriotic duty and adventure appealed to many young men who had not only volunteered for wartime service, but sought and paid for their own training at camps before the war. American labor organizations favored voluntary service over conscription. Labor leader Samuel Gompers argued for volunteerism in letters to the congressional committees considering that question. Quote, the organized labor movement, he wrote, has always been fundamentally opposed to compulsion, end quote. Referring to American values as a role model for others, he continued, quote, It is the hope of organized labor to demonstrate that under voluntary conditions and institutions, the Republic of the United States can mobilize its greatest strength, resources, and efficiency, end quote. 
Despite fears of popular resistance, Congress quickly instituted a reasonably equitable and locally administered system to draft men for the military. On May 18, 1917, Congress approved the Selective Service Act, and President Wilson signed it a week later. The new legislation avoided the unpopular system of bonuses and substitutes used during the Civil War, and was generally received without major objection by the American people. The Conscription Act initially required men from ages 21 to 30 to register for compulsory military service. Basic physical fitness was the primary requirement for service. The resulting tests offered the emerging fields of social science a range of data collection tools and new screening methods. The Army Medical Department examined the general condition of young American men selected for service from the population. The Surgeon General compiled his findings from draft records in the 1919 report, Defects Found in Drafted Men, a snapshot of the 2.5 million men examined for military service. Of that group, 1,533,973 physical defects were recorded, often more than one per individual. More than 34% of those examined were rejected for service or later discharged for neurological, psychiatric, or mental deficiencies. To provide a basis for the neurological, psychiatric, and mental evaluations, the Army used cognitive skills tests to determine intelligence. About 1.9 million men were tested on intelligence. Soldiers who could read took the Army Alpha Test. Illiterates and non-English-speaking immigrants took the nonverbal equivalent, the Army Beta Test, which relied on visual testing procedures. Robert M. Yerkes, president of the American Psychological Association and chairman of the Committee on the Psychological Examination of Recruits, developed and analyzed the tests. His data argued that the actual mental age of recruits was only about 13 years. Among recent immigrants, he said, it was even lower. As a eugenicist, he interpreted the results as roughly equivalent to a mild level of retardation and as an indication of racial, deteri racial deterioration. Years later, experts agreed that the results misrepresented the levels of education for the recruits and revealed defects in the design of the tests. The experience of service in the Army expanded many individual social horizons as native-born and foreign-born soldiers served together. Immigrants had been welcomed into Union ranks during the Civil War, including large numbers of Irish and Germans who had joined and fought alongside native-born men. Some Germans in the Civil War fought in units where German was the main language. Between 1917 and 1918, the Army accepted immigrants with some hesitancy because of the widespread public agitation against hyphenated Americans. Others were segregated. Prevailing racial attitudes among white Americans mandated the assignment of white and black soldiers to different units. Despite racial discrimination, many black leaders, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, supported the war effort and sought a place at the front for black soldiers. Black leaders viewed military service as an opportunity to demonstrate to white society the willingness and ability of black men to assume all duties and responsibilities of citizens, including wartime sacrifice. If black soldiers were drafted and fought and died on equal footing with white soldiers, then white Americans would see that they deserved full citizenship. The War Department, however, barred black troops from combat and relegated black soldiers to segregated service units where they worked as general laborers. In France, the experiences of black soldiers during training and periods of leave proved transformative. The Army often restricted the privileges of black soldiers to ensure that the conditions they encountered in Europe did not lead them to question their place in American society. However, black soldiers were not the only ones tempted by European vices. To ensure that American doughboys did not compromise their special identity as men of the New World who arrived to save the old, several religious and progressive organizations created an extensive program designed to keep the men pure of heart, mind, and body. With assistance from the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, and other temperance organizations, the War Department put together a program of schools, sightseeing tours, and recreational facilities to provide wholesome and educational outlets. The soldiers welcomed most of these activities from these groups, but many still managed to find and enjoy their traditional recreations of soldiers at war. Women reacted to the war preparations by joining several military and civilian organizations. Their enrollment and actions in these organizations proved to be a pioneering effort for American women at war.
Military leaders authorized the women gender, or the, sorry, the permanent gender transition of several occupations that gave women opportunities to don uniforms where none had existed before in history. Civilian wartime organizations, although chaired by male members of the business elite, boasted all female volunteer workforces. Women performed the bulk of volunteer work during the war. The admittance of women brought considerable upheaval. The War and Navy Departments authorized the enlistment of women to fill positions in several established administrative occupations. The gendered transition of these jobs freed more men to join combat units. Army women served as telephone operators. For the Signal Corps, Navy women enlisted as Yemen clerical workers, and the first groups of women joined the Marine Corps in July 1918. Approximately 25,000 nurses served in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps for uh, duty stateside and overseas, and about 100 female physicians were contracted by the Army. Neither the female nurses nor the doctors served as commissioned officers in the military. The Army and Navy chose to appoint them instead, which left the status of professional medical women hovering somewhere between the enlisted and officer ranks. As a result, many female nurses and doctors suffered various physical and mental abuses at the hands of their male co-workers with no system of redress in place. Millions of women also volunteered in civilian organizations such as the American Red Cross, the Young Men's and Women's Christians Associations, the Salvation Army. Most, uh, most women performed their volunteer duties in communal spaces owned by the leaders of the municipal sit chapters of these organizations. Women met at designated times to roll bandages, prepare and serve meals and snacks, package and ship supplies, and organize community fundraisers. The variety of volunteer opportunities gave women the opportunity, or sorry, the ability to appear in public spaces and promote charitable activities for the war effort. Female volunteers encouraged entire communities, including children, to get involved in war work. While most of these efforts focused on support for the home front, a small percentage of female volunteers served with the American Expeditionary Force in France. Jim Crow segregation in both the military and the civilian sector stood as a barrier for black women who wanted to give their time to the war effort. The military prohibited black women from serving as enlisted or appointed medical personnel. The only avenue for black women to wear a military uniform existed with the armies of the Allied nations. A few black female doctors and nurses joined the French Foreign Legion to escape the racism in the American army. Black female volunteers faced the same discrimination in civilian wartime organizations. White leaders of the American Red Cross, YMCA, YWCA, and Salvation Army municipal chapters refused to admit black women as equal participants. Black women were forced to charter auxiliary units as subsidiary divisions and were given little guidance on organizing volunteers. They turned instead to the community for support and recruited millions of women for auxiliaries that supported the nearly 200,000 black soldiers and sailors serving in the military. While most female volunteers labored to care for black families on the home front, three YMCA secretaries worked with the black troops in France. Section 5. On the Home Front In the early years of the war, Americans were generally detached from the events in Europe. Progressive Arab reform politics dominated the political landscape, and Americans remained most concerned with the shifting role of government at home. However, the facts of the war could not be ignored by the public. The destruction taking pl place on European battlefields and ensuing casualty rates exposed an the unprecedented brutality of modern warfare. Increasingly, a sense that the fate of the Western world lay in the victory or defeat of the Allies took hold in the United States. President Wilson, a committed progressive, articulated a global vision of democracy even as he embraced neutrality. As war engulfed Europe, it seemed apparent that the United States' economic power would shape the outcome of the conflict regardless of any American military intervention. By 1916, American trade with the Allies tripled, while trade with the Central Powers shrank to, sh shrank to less than 1% of previous levels. The progression of war in Europe generated fierce national debates about military preparedness. The Allies and the Central Powers had quickly raised and mobilized vast armies and navies. The United States still had a small military. When America entered the war, the mobilization of military resources and the cultivation of popular support consumed the country, generating enormous publicity and propaganda campaigns. 
President Wilson created the Committee on Public Information, known as the Creel Committee, headed by progressive George Creel, to inspire patriotism and generate support for military adventures. Creel enlisted the help of Hollywood studios and other budding media outlets to cultivate a view of the war that pitted democracy against imperialism and framed America as a crusading nation rescuing Western civilization from medievalism and militarism. As war passions flared, challenges to the onrushing patriotic sentiment that America was making the world safe for democracy were considered disloyal. Wilson signed the Espionage Act in 1917 and the Sedition Act in 1918, stripping dissenters and protesters of their rights to publicly resist the war. Critics and protesters were imprisoned. Immigrants, labor unions, and political radicals became targets of government investigations and an ever more hostile public culture. Meanwhile, the government insisted that individual financial contributions made a discernible difference for the men on the Western Front. Americans lent their financial support to the war effort by purchasing war bonds or supporting the Liberty Loan Drive. Many Americans, however, sacrificed much more than money. Section 6. Before the Armistice European powers struggled to adapt to the brutality of modern war. Until the spring of 1917, the Allies possessed few effective defensive measures against submarine attacks. German submarines sank more than a thousand ships by the time the United States entered the war. The rapid addition of American naval escorts to the British surface fleet and the establishment of a convoy system countered much of the effect of the German submarines. Shipping and military losses declined rapidly just as the American Navy arrived in Europe in large numbers. Although much of the equipment still needed to make the transatlantic passage, the physical presence of the army proved a fatal blow to the German war plans. In July 1917, after one last disastrous offensive by the Germans, the Russian army disintegrated. The Tsarist regime collapsed, and in November 1917, Vladimir Lenin's Bolshevik party came to power. Russia soon surrendered to the German demands and exited the war, freeing Germany to finally fight the one-front war it had desired since 1914. The German military quickly shifted hundreds of thousands of soldiers from the Eastern Theater in preparation for a new series of offensive planned for the following year in France. In March 1918, Germany launched the Kaiserschlacht, the Spring Offensive, a series of five major attacks. By the middle of July 1918, each and every one had failed to break through the Western Front. On August 8, 1918, two million men of the American Expeditionary Forces joined British and French armies in a series of successful counteroffensives that pushed the disintegrating German lines back across France. German General Erich Ludendorff referred to the launch of the counteroffensive as the Black Day of the German Army. The German offensive gamble exhausted Germany's faltering military effort. Defeat was inevitable. Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated at the request of the German military leaders, and the new democratic government agreed to an armistice, a ceasefire, on November 11, 1918. German military forces withdrew from France and Belgium and returned to a Germany teetering on the brink of chaos. By the end of the war, more than 4.7 million American men had served in all branches of the military, 4 million in the army, 600,000 in the navy, and about 80,000 in the Marine Corps. The United States lost over 100,000 men, 53,000 died in battle, and even more from disease. Their terrible sacrifice, however, paled before the Europeans. After four years of brutal stalemate, France had suffered almost a million and a half dead, and Germany even more. Both nations lost about 4% of their population to the war, and death was not done. Section 7. The War and the Influenza Pandemic Even as war raged on the Western Front, a new, deadly threat loomed, influenza. In the spring of 1918, a strain of the flu virus appeared in the farm country of Haskell County, Kansas, and hit nearby Camp Funston, one of the largest army training camps in the nation. The virus spread like wildfire. The camp had brought disparate populations together, shuffled them between bases, sent them back to their homes across the nation, and, in consecutive waves, deployed them around the world. Between March and May 1918, 14 of the largest American military training camps reported outbreaks of influenza. Some of the infected soldiers carried the virus on troop transports to France. By September 1918, influenza spread to all training camps in the United States, and then it mutated. 
the second wave of the virus, a mutated strain, was even deadlier than the first. It struck down those in the prime of their lives. A disproportionate amount of influenza victims were between the age of 18 and 40, or 35. In Europe, influenza hit both sides of the Western Front. The Spanish influenza, quote, or the Spanish lady, misnamed due to the accounts of the disease that first appeared in uncensored newspapers of neutral Spain, resulted in the deaths of an estimated 50 million people worldwide. Reports from the Surgeon General of the Army revealed that while 227,000 soldiers were hospitalized from wounds received in battle, almost a half million suffered from influenza. The worst part of the epidemic struck during the height of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in the fall of 1918 and weakened the combat capabilities of the American and German armies. During the war, more soldiers died from influenza than combat. The pandemic continued to spread after the armistice before finally fading in the early 1920s. No cure was ever found. Section 8. The 14 Points and the League of Nations. As the flu virus racked the world, Europe and America rejoiced at the end of hostilities. On December 4, 1918, President Wilson became the first American president to travel overseas during his term. He intended to shape the peace. The war brought an abrupt end to the four great European imperial powers. The German, Russian, Austria-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires evaporated, and the map of Europe was redrawn to accommodate new independent nations. As part of the armistice, Allied forces followed the retreating Germans and occupied territories in the Rhineland to prevent Germany from reigniting war. As Germany disarmed, Wilson and the other Allied leaders gathered in France at Versailles for the Paris Peace Conference to dictate the terms of a settlement to the war. After months of deliberation, the Treaty of Versailles officially ended the war. Earlier that year, on January 8, 1918, before a joint session of Congress, President Wilson offered an ambitious statement of war aims and peace terms known as the 14 Points. The plan not only dealt with territorial issues, but offered principles on which a long-term peace could be built. But in January 1918, Germany still anticipated a favorable verdict on the battlefield and did not seriously consider accepting the terms of the 14 Points. The Allies were even more dismissive. French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau remarked, The good Lord only had 10 points. President Wilson labored to realize his vision of the post-war world. The United States had entered the fray, Wilson proclaimed, to make it the world safe for democracy. At the center of the plan was a novel international organization, the League of Nations, charged with keeping a worldwide peace by preventing the kind of destruction that tore across Europe and, quote, affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike, end quote. This promise of collective security, that an attack on one sovereign member would be viewed as an attack on all, was a key component of the 14 points. But the fight for peace was daunting. While President Wilson was celebrated in Europe and welcomed as the God of Peace, his fellow statesmen were less enthusiastic about his plans for post-war Europe. America's closest allies had little interest in the League of Nations. Allied leaders sought to guarantee the future safety of their own nations. Unlike the United States, the Allies endured the horrors of the war, the war firsthand. They refused to sacrifice further. The negotiations made clear that British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was more interested in preserving Britain's imperial domain, while French Prime Minister Clemenceau sought a peace that recognized the Allies' victory and the Central Powers' culpability. He wanted reparations, severe financial penalties, and limits on Germany's future ability to wage war. The fight for the League of Nations was therefore largely on the shoulders of President Wilson. By June 1919, the final version of the treaty was signed and President Wilson was able to return home. The treaty was a compromise that included demands for German reparations, provisions for the League of Nations, and the promise of collective security. For President Wilson, it was an imperfect peace, but an imperfect peace was better than none at all. The real fight for the League of Nations was on the American home front. Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts stood as the most prominent opponent of the League of Nations. As chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and an influential Republican leader, he could block ratification of the treaty. 
Lodge attacked the treaty for potentially robbing the United States of its sovereignty. Never an isolationist, Lodge demanded instead that the country deal with its own problems in its own way, free from the collective security and oversight offered by the League of Nations. Unable to match Lodge's influence in the Senate, President Wilson took his case to the American people in the hopes that ordinary voters might be convinced that the only guarantee of future world peace was the League of Nations. During his grueling cross-country trip, however, President Wilson suffered an incapacitating stroke. His opponents had the upper hand. President Wilson's dream for the League of Nations died on the floor of the Senate. Lodge's opponents successfully blocked America's entry into the League of Nations, an organization conceived and championed by the American president. The League of Nations operated with 58 sovereign members, but the United States refused to join, refused to lend it American power, and refused to provide it with the power needed to fulfill its purpose. Section 9. The Aftermath of World War I. The war had transformed the world. The Middle East, for instance, was drastically changed. For centuries, the Ottoman Empire had shaped life in the region. Before the war, the Middle East had three main centers of power, the Ottoman Empire, Egypt, and Iran. President Wilson's call for self-determination appealed to many under the Ottoman Empire's rule. In the aftermath of the war, Wilson sent a commission to investigate the region to determine the conditions and aspirations of the populace. The King-Crane Commission found that most of the inhabitants favored an independent state free of European control. However, these wishes were largely ignored and the lands of the former Ottoman Empire were divided into mandates through the Treaty of Sèvres at the San, Rame uh, San Remo Conference in 1920. The Ottoman Empire disintegrated into several nations, many created by European powers with little regard to ethnic realities. These Arab provinces were ruled by Britain and France, and the new nation of Turkey emerged from the former heartland of Anatolia. According to the League of Nations, mandates were inhabited by peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world. Though allegedly for the benefit of the people of the Middle East, the mandate system was essentially a reimagined form of 19th century imperialism. France received Syria. Britain took control of Iraq, Palestine, and Transjordan, the Jordan. The United States was asked to become a mandate power, but declined. The geographical realignment of the Middle East also included the formation of two new nations, the Kingdom of Hejaz and Yemen. The Kingdom of Hejaz was ruled by Sharif uh, Hussein and only lasted until the 1920s when it became part of Saudi Arabia. The 1917 Russian Revolution, meanwhile, inflamed American fears of communism. The fates of Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, two Italian-born anarchists who were convicted of robbery and murder in 1920, epitomized a sudden American Red Scare. Their arrest, trial, and execution, meanwhile, inspired many leftists and dissenting artists to express their sympathy with the accused, such as Maxwell Anderson's Gods of the Lighting or Upton Sinclair's Boston. The Sacco Vincetti case demonstrated an exacerbated nervousness about immigrants and the potential spread of radical ideas, especially those related to international communism. When in March 1918, the Bolsheviks signed a separate peace treaty with Germany, the Allies planned to send troops to northern Russia and Siberia to prevent German influence and fight the Bolshevik Revolution. Wilson agreed, and, in a little-known foreign intervention, American troops remained in Russia as late as 1920. Although the Bolshevik rhetoric of self-determination followed many of the ideals of Wilson's 14 points, Vladimir Lenin supported revolutions against imperial rule across the world, the American commitment to self-rule was hardly strong enough to overcome powerful strains of anti-communism. At home, the United States grappled with harsh post-war realities. Racial tensions culminated in the Red Summer of 1919, when violence broke out in at least 25 cities, including Chicago and Washington, D.C. The riots originated from wartime racial tensions. Industrial war production and massive wartime service created vast labor shortages, and thousands of black Southerners traveled to the North and Midwest to escape the traps of Southern poverty. But the so-called Great Migration sparked significant racial conflict as white Northerners returning, uh, and returning veterans fought to reclaim their jobs and their neighborhoods from new black migrants. Many black Americans who had fled the Jim Crow South and traveled halfway around the world to fight for the United States would not so easily accept post-war racism. The overseas experience of black Americans and their return triggered a dramatic change in black communities. 
W.E.B. Du Bois wrote boldly of returning soldiers, quote, We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. Make way for democracy. End quote. But white Americans desired a return to the status quo, a world that did not include social, political, or economic equality for black people. In 1919, America suffered through the Red Summer. Riots erupted across the country from April until October. The massive bloodshed included thousands of injuries, hundreds of deaths, and vast destruction of private and public property across the nation. The Chicago riot from July 27th to August 3rd, 1919, considered the summer's worst, sparked a week of mob violence, murder, and arson. Race riots had rocked the nation before, but the Red Summer was something new. Recently empowered black Americans actively defended their families and homes from hostile white rioters, often with militant force. This behavior galvanized many in black communities, but it also shocked white Americans who alternatively interpreted black resistance as a desire for total revolution or as a new positive step in the path toward black civil rights. In the riot's aftermath, James Weldon Johnson wrote, quote, Can't they understand that the more Negroes they outrage, the more determined the whole race becomes to secure the full rights and privileges of free men? End quote. Those six hot months in 1919 forever altered American society and roused and terrified those that experienced the sudden and devastating outbreaks of violence. Section 10. Conclusion. World War I decimated millions and profoundly altered the course of world history. Post-war instabilities led directly toward a global depression and a second world war. The war sparked the Bolshevik Revolution, which led to the Soviet Union and later the Cold War. It created Middle Eastern nations and aggravated ethnic tensions that the United States could never overcome. And the United States had fought on the European mainland as a major power. America's place in the world was never the same. By whipping up nationalist passions, American attitudes toward radicalism, dissent, and immigration were poisoned. Post-war disillusionment shattered Americans' hopes for the progress of the modern world. The war came and went, leaving in its place the bloody wreckage of an old world through which the United States traveled to a new and uncertain future.